This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right. Bonus episode time. The nameless bonus episode where we talk about things that, I don't know, that everyone else is trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, it feels like uh, you texted me a couple of days ago because the article and the picture, frankly, uh, about of Jerry Jones uh, from 65 years ago standing in front of uh, his high school blocking this. I, I mean, how would you describe that photo? I don't want to... I don't want to uh, lead the jury, but you obviously have a lot to say about it. So please. Yeah, it was basically a photo of Jerry Jones. Like, let's be plain. Jerry Jones is in the middle of a race riot where a bunch of white uh, high school kids were trying to use violence and intimidation to stop six black kids from going to from integrating a, a high school. So this is David Dennis. I don't know if I introduced you properly. <laughs> no, you did not. You did not. <laughs> David Dennis. I mean, people who are making sure uh, that people know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just so you know <laughs> where to send your vitriol is David Dennis. He, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's a fair characterization. So the funny thing is, the picture got passed around the internet uh, with a lot of commentary before people read the article. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that people have read the article because it felt like a lot of people's reaction was like appeared as if they didn't read the article to be, yeah i don't know i guess i i kind of wonder what your take was it is i i want to hear what you have to say about it before i say my piece yeah i mean i think that the photo like a lot of people characterize the photo as just this like one gotcha photo of jerry jones and everybody was supposed to be scandalized by it. but i think the thing is that it, it's it was used in the larger context of his his race relations and, and namely in not hiring a black court, a, a black coach uh, in his career and sort of contextualizing that with the history of where he's come from. Right. And being an 80 year old white guy from Little Rock, Arkansas. And there's a lot of stuff about his grandfather and his family and where that history comes from. Part of that history is, of course, the fact that he was at this um, this protest, violent race riot thing. And, you know, the issue here is, I mean, obviously, a lot of people are going to say this took place, 50, you know, 65 years ago. He was only 15. You know, what what should he know? But I think the problem is in 2022, his answer is still really troublesome. You know, yeah. uh, the idea like you don't just wander. It was just like he basically characterized if he just wandered into this event, not quite knowing what was going on. And was like, wow, that's weird. There's like white kids yelling at black kids. I'm going to go home now. That's there's no way to no reason to believe that happened. This was on the net. This was on the news. They were uh, the governor was calling the National Guard. This was he knew where he was going at the time. And even if he showed up not knowing what he was at some point, he heard the N word and he heard a lot of violence and he just stood there and did not stand with the black people. So you're standing sort of against them. And in 2022, you got to have a better answer than I just moseyed on and whoopsie daisy. I was in a race riot. Yeah. He, um, so I, I'm, I don't know. I'm in a weird place with this because like, I didn't have the reaction to the photograph that I think I was supposed to have, or that people uh. wanted me to have is like, yeah, his explanation was he knew what was happening, but he wanted to like see what was going on. Check like, out the vibes. He was yeah, doing a vibe, a vibe check on the, yeah, on the race he, ride. He knew what was popping and he was told not to go there, but mm -hmm. he went anyway because he was a curious 14, 15 year old and mm -hmm. he wanted to see, check on the vibe, as you said. Yes. Uh -huh. Which like that doesn't seem true, but also like, is it wrong for me to say I don't care? Like, I, I think it's because I'm not surprised. Yeah. It's like, I'm not surprised that Jerry Jones would be there, I, I, honestly. And I'm not, like, up in arms and furious about it. I think it's an interesting photograph to, like, juxtapose with um his record on mm -hmm. hiring black coaches. But I think the damning stuff to me was his response to questions and not even like you point out, not even his response to the questions about then. Cause yeah, he didn't have a good explanation for it. He did not seem apologetic or like mm -hmm. re remorseful. That's a problem. But again, maybe because I read it, I didn't have time to be bothered by that. But what mm -hmm. I was more bothered by was he still don't know. Like right. he still don't understand because 
his father, like his grandparents, I think they're they're like on some list of like open racists. His right. father, he believed his father to be more progressive because he owned a um grocery store that he allowed black people to enter in the front door and shop in. And he had uh, I had black friends. He had right, black yes. friends. Uh -huh. He also was fond of soul food. He ate chitlins growing up. Mm -hmm. These are like things that were pointed to as reasons why he was comfortable with black people and he played sports and he was around black people in that way. But I think what was really unfortunate is he was preaching something that, that like it, it, it makes me uncomfortable in large part because it's what it's not uncommon. He's like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. Like he he yeah. one acknowledges that, there is a problem that needs to be addressed and he mm. pays lip service to wanting to be a part of the solution. But he also does this thing that like, often you hear it from successful black people, this right. like respectability politics outwork. And it's like, I don't hate that as a message between black people internally where it's like, this world is unfair. You're going to have to work twice as hard. That's mm -hmm. a fact. But then where there are other people, <laughs> billionaire white man who tells his great rags to riches story involves him asking for a favor to get into Augusta National to play fucking golf. Where like black what? people cannot play. Where yeah. black people can <laughs> So he's like, he's like, all you gotta do is outwork them and you gotta not say no and you gotta find ways to make stuff happen. Like I did when I called my college coach <laughs> and was like, You think you could get me an Augusta National? This is the only way I can get this this big uh this big energy deal is if I can get an Augusta National. And he was like, I don't know. I can try to pull some strings. And this man pulls some strings for him. And that is what kicks off his, like, empire. And he keeps right. pointing to all these itch situations that he thinks are great stories of inspiration. See, you can be like me, too, if you just work your ass off and use all your contacts. When the actuality, that's the point. There's, that's the point. We, we don't have it. We don't have, we don't have the, access to that. But here's the boot. Here's the here's the thing about the bootstrap thing that's so interesting to me, right? Is that everybody's like Jerry Jones grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. He was, you know, what what do you expect? Of course, he's going to be, you know, have some sort of racism. Why can't he pull himself up from the bootstraps out of racism? Like, why can't you Ooh. bootstrap yourself out of nice. your upbringing? Like, we're talking about pull yourself kids. up by your moral bootstraps. Yeah, pull yourself up by the like we talk about black kids, and you're like you were raised a certain way. Like pull yourself up and overcome, you know, your your circumstances of poverty and lack of uh, resources at your school. Pull yourself up. Well, Jerry Jones, and then we at the same time say, well, Jerry Jones, he didn't have a choice. That's how he was raised. No, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and go be a better white man to black people. Like that's something that you can do for yourself if you want to talk about self actualization instead of just saying the only way to pull yourself up by your bootstraps is call your friend and ask him to go play golf at a place where black people cannot play and tell that story to black people who have access. The black people were telling the story to had access to literally zero percent of the story that he was telling. Like every Every second of that story was unrelatable to 99.9% .9 of black people in America and probably 100% of the black people in that room. Uh, yeah, that's the hardest part is I think that he believes that he is now on the right side. Right. And that's the, I think that's what's more discouraging than anything is we are going to need, and by we, I don't mean black people, I mean us as a country. We are going to need champions with power and influence to be on the right side of this. Mm -hmm. He thinks that even if the most generous view is he believes that he was on the wrong side because he was unaware. Right. And now he believes that he is aware and now he's on the right side, but he still don't understand. Like it's, it seems clear to me that he didn't study for the tests. He did. He, and, he, and he and he thought that he he could charisma his way through it. 
Well, that and that's the can. thing. He can is the thing. He can. He can't. You can't. I mean, nothing. That's the thing. Like all, all of this. Oh, I feel bad for Jerry Jones. What's the worst that's going to happen to him? He's going to do a couple interviews, and then sorry, like people, it's going to get uncomfortable for a little bit, and then he's going to go on and talk about Dak Prescott and like quarterbacks or whatever. But like, I don't know what's worse. Like they they, they try to interview every owner. All you know, thirty one of them said no. Jerry Jones said yes. I don't know what's worse. Like that, thirty one owners were like, no, no I got too much of a bad history of black folks to do this interview or jerry jones was like nope i got it <laughs> like i'm good <laughs> like yeah. I, like we're on the good side of this i can take this interview and i can handle it i don't know which one is more like i don't know which one the lack of self-awareness or the actual realization that no if they ask me literally three questions about my relationship with black people like my career may be over it's all bad but i don't know which one is worse i don't know at least there's some hope there's these are those other doors, the 31 other doors that are closed. You're like, maybe there's a chance <laughs> that somebody read a book behind one of them doors. But it's clear that Jerry Jones is making and like. So I was quoted in the article and mm -hmm. I didn't know what the article was be about. I talked to um them over the summer about the black coaches thing. And they asked me about like experiences with Jerry Jones and. I, I've had nothing but positive experiences with Jerry Jones. I mean, as positive as negotiations, CBA mm -hmm. negotiations can be. But I know I knew who he was. Mm -hmm. you know, like right. I didn't expect anything different from him. And it seems like he I guess this is I don't want to be repetitive. I think we covered this ground. But the craziest part to me is, yeah, he knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. He knew what these questions were going to be about. And that was him prepared. Yeah. And that yeah. was him. I understand the issue. He had 65 years to prepare for the question of like, you were at this thing when you were 15 years. Like he had a very long time to prepare for this question. Like that is a, like a AP photo. Like that is a photo that has been spread around all over the internet. And people have seen the photo. He knew he was in the photo. He knew he was there. And at some point, somebody was going to ask this question. And his best answer was like, gee, gee golly, I was on my way to the nickel and dime store to get a Kit Kat. And whoop, there are people gathered around. And I just walked over there to see what was going on. Like, that is his best answer. Instead of being like, look, I was at this place. I was, you know, I was 15. I was impressionable. I was around a bunch of racist folks. I was going to hang out with them. I was too scared to like stand up for these people. And like, I've worked all of these years to make up for it. No, his thing was just like, whoopsie. I just ended up, you know, you know, terrorizing six black kids. Sorry. Like that just not, that does not jive with somebody who has done any sort of real reckoning with their history or where they need to go to be the progressive person that they purport themselves to be. Yeah. His, um, motivation has always been financial since mm -hmm. and that was what that was the context that i talked about him and is like he was one of the easier owners to negotiate with because it, it got down to like it was very clear what was important mm -hmm. to him and there was no like sugarcoating it and he doesn't try to and in this interview it seemed like he tried to right and this is probably why he normally don't try to he has colorful language mm -hmm. where he like uses like cutesy folksy uh twang to say like these weird um like aphorisms he has that but he uses those to cut to the core of what's important to him right and that's money but you saw what happened when he tried to like deal with a tough issue in a way that is not direct and it got messy and confusing and i don't know to your point forget 65 years because like all right he had no reason to confront any of this. Right. Like at no point did someone, did his life be impacted by this mm -hmm. until like recently, like Colin Kaepernick and, and beyond. Right. Like it seemed like it has been something that has impacted his life. And maybe you should take a second to think about this. And then he was preparing for the, like this. I'm sorry to keep dwelling on this, but this continues to blow my mind is he, probably maybe sat down with somebody because this is a big deal. He's the only right. one speaking for all of the league, the league office and all of this. This is a big deal. So maybe he sat down with somebody and he told this person that this is what I'm going to say. And this person was like, sure, go ahead and say it. And he <laughs> thought he killed it. 
Right. And no one realized. So yeah, it just, I don't know. It's like, this is like, this should be the question that is in the black box. Like the, the break in case of emergency, you have researched this question since 1989. And like, whenever they ask you about the time you attended the, like the racial violence attack <laughs> thing, you should have your answer memorized for the past 30 years. But he did not, and because he does not see that as a big deal. Could but it's it, and you know, people again will say it was sixty five years ago. But like him talking about punishing people for kneeling was not sixty five years right. ago. Him standing by why Bob McNair said the inmates run the asylum was not sixty five years yep. ago. His cronyism with Donald Trump and all the stuff that they've been hanging out that was not sixty five years ago. So it's all in context. Like if you have lived a life like to make that picture obsolete, then this would be a non-story. You know, if you have lived the type of life that where you could say, when I was 15, I did a super wrong thing, my bad, but look at all the rest of the years fine, then that it's not a story. But he has nothing to stand on that substantiates that except for the fact that he's nice to black people. Like that's sort of what it is. Like he's a night, like everybody's like, he's a super nice guy to black people. Yeah. And to your point, black people make him a lot of money. So yeah. why would you not be super nice to black people? His big thing he points to is I almost hired Denny Green that one time. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was very open about, yeah, this business is about who you know. It's like I hire people without interviews. And like now he has to interview people, which like it makes it clear that without him saying it, that the interviews are a sham. Right. Like at least in his building, they are a sham. He like kind of made it clear that like I hire people based on relationships. I hired my college roommate, I hired my college coach. I hired this other guy because his dad was a scout and he'd been around here for a long time. I hired based on relationships. One time I almost hired Dennis Green. Right. <laughs> That's it. That's yeah. I mean, that that is it. So, yeah, it's sad. It is what it is. And I think the most discouraging thing is he is the picture of progress that they want to put out there as far as their owners are. concerned. And he's the most Teflon person in the NFL. Oh, yeah. You know, like yeah. all the like we're going to talk about it and like he may not even ever address it. He may not ever have to, you know, he's just going to be fine with it and everything's going to be OK. And and like cowboys are still going to be beloved amongst black America as as they have been yeah. forever. And, you know, black people who love the cowboys who always say we always know who Jerry Jones was. This is not a surprise. Like I had to argue with the black cowboys, dude. Cowboys fan a week ago because he felt like Kyrie Irving was like some victim of some like conspiracy like you like you cannot be super militant black man and be like it's okay <laughs> Jerry Jones is like Jerry Jones is okay with me I know what I'm dealing with and I like those things don't don't jive and like it's I know we love I know we as black people love the Cowboys but at some point like you can free yourself you really can free yourself from like having to love something that Jerry Jones owns. It doesn't have to be this way. All right. That was fun. Yeah. I'm going to bring you up for the fun stuff. I'm going to, no uh, I'm going to go uh light a rib with my lighter. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk? Can we, can we, can we talk about my guy real quick? There's nothing to talk about. Go ahead. What do you want to say? My man at the Bayou classic with those that do not know Southern and Grambling HBCU football game out thanksgiving weekend huge event in in louisiana they caught my man in 4k lighting up everybody thought it was a blunt that he was lighting up because he had all of the mannerisms so i've heard of lighting up a blunt and he was but he was lighting one single barbecue rib and heating it up with a lighter and he ate it i feel like here's my hot take i feel like now the barbecue rib has replaced turkey as the official meat of thanksgiving because that is the most thanksgiving that's who we should celebrate for Thanksgiving every year. Where he get that rib from? He brought it in his pocket. I feel like I, I want to say he brought it in his pocket. I want to say it was know. tucked I in mean, his sock like Marshawn Lynch's chicken wings at one time. I feel, I like, feel like you can't bring food <laughs> into the arena, and I don't think that they serve uh, ribs. If they do serve ribs, then they would probably be hot. So like, uh, I don't think. Must I remind you how resourceful this man is? So, oh no no I'm no sure. no no! I'm not I'm not saying that he didn't bring it in. I'm just saying that if he brought it in. 
he had to stash that thing. He stashed it somewhere. I'm sure. I bet he had a rib compartment in his jacket that's like that has man, a nice trafficking rib, like a little rotisserie, <laughs> like a little rotisserie thing in his jacket that he just that he just brings in. And uh-huh. he, the man, my man, had a plan. When a rib, when you need a rib, you just need a rib. And, you know, <laughs> it was like an emergency right. rib that he had. I need I need you to find my man and do an in depth interview with him. Yes, if you're out there, if you're out there, rib I mean, man, an innovator. If you're out there, rib man, reach out. I want to talk to you. So we can <laughs> chronicle this moment in black history that will never be forgotten. All right, brother. Thank you. All right, my man. Anything you want to plug? Uh, buy my book still. It's still on sale. It's still for sale. The movement made us wherever books are sold. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all that stuff. Buy my book. Uh, it's a great stocking stuffer, uh, especially for, you know, if you want to send some to your dad, send some to your kids, anybody, history buff. Uh, anything it's it's great it's a great just piece of work it. just buy it all right appreciate you bro my man this is the dominique foxworth show 